Our first speaker today is J.D. Rosa. She's a PhD researcher in history of art and architecture at the University of Durham. And she'll be talking to us right now on rearticulating indigenous histories of art and the book, Lessons from Guanam Poma. Thank you. My presentation is 16 minutes long. So to keep in time, I'm going to be reading. So I apologize for not making eye contact, but I invite you to get lost in the images because it, it, it is what it's all about. All right. So this illustrated world chronicle, El Primer Nueva Crónica y Buen Gobierno, the first new chronicle in good government, was completed in Peru in 1615 by Don Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala and is both unique and commonplace at the same time. Unique because it's the only known extensively illustrated Andean, and by Andean, I mean geographically, not culturally, uh, Andean chronicle by an author and artist of both matrilineal and patrilineal Quechua speaking indigenous parentage. Jarovirka and Jarovirka on his father's side and a descendant of Tupac Yupanqui on his mother's side. Completed during the first century of Spanish invasion. Yet it's commonplace because it's, the, it's only one example in a mountain of paper where indigenous scribes in America took to the pen in acts of political, literary, and artistic participation within an early colonial social order. Guamampoma includes the indigenous scribe among the 1,200 folios in his manuscript, 400 of which are full page drawings. With quill in hand, the bookshelf behind the scribe holds codices, as well as an earthenware vessel used to archive quipus, the knotted yarn where information was stored showing how he had to dominate both codes and negotiate between them. Guaman Poma himself states the reasons for his chronicle in a 1615 letter to Philip III of Spain, where he states, and I'm, I'm quoting this letter, where he states that the intention is to shed light on the truth regarding the lineage of pre-Inca and Inca queens, kings and governors, how they governed, their rights, ceremonies and dress, how they entertained through festivities, banquets, hunting, and pastimes, how they discovered gold and silver mines, and the ill fate of their descendants since being conquered, quote unquote, by Spanish viceroys, corregidores, administrators, and priests of the Christian doctrine. In that letter, he twice mentions how badly indigenous communities are treated by this lot and the great losses they suffered to the present day his present day, 1615, around. He states that he worked for 30 years on the Chronicle for God and King in order for the King's historians to, do, to be better informed and for the King to do a better job. Much of the text and images deal with the violence, pain, and suffering of the indigenous Andean populations and those of African origin and descent and ends with a treatise for good government called Buen Gobierno. Through an art historical and book historical lens, there's the Payacona, 50 years old, that weaves textiles and is respected in the community. That yarn would also be used for quipus, such as the one held in the hand of this philosopher, poet, and astrologer from Lucanas named Juan Yumpa. So we can imagine what kind of information was knotted into the yarn. There's the Ashlar masonry of the Inca, uh, which is much more difficult than the polygonal masonry we see most. There's this remarkable image of art viewers and art users, a woman and man of African origin or descent. And we even catch a glimpse of those once known artists we have so often heard called anonymous. Yet, despite this abundance of text and imagery on local communities written and drawn by a local author and artist, Guaman Poma's manuscript is most often described as an imitation of a European print book. With focus placed on the Christian images often described simply as copies of Flemish prints. 
In colonial discourse, however, mimicry is not a neutral term. As Homi Baba states, when constructed around an ambivalence, discourse on colonial mimicry continually produces a slippage of difference that defines the other as almost the same, but not quite, or almost the same, but not white. In Guamampoma's drawings, there's a negotiation, there's a reorganization of the image that harmonizes and disrupts at the same time. In critical art historical terms, this is called appropriation. It's a process that works silently but concretely to shift a prior semiotic assemblage and maintain it at the same time, all the while being made to stand for something new. The focus is not on the end product of signification, but on any of its prior stages, revealing the occluded motivating forces for the appropriation. Viewing this manuscript through this process allows for the inquiry to be aimed towards the active agents of signification, rather than the interpretation of images according to Christian, doc Christian iconography. I argue that by viewing the Kronika and its images from the starting point of a European canon-centered history of art and history of the book sets it on a path where it can largely only be viewed in relation to Europe. Displacing and negating Poma and the local communities he advocates for their central role in book and art production. In this image, for example, we're not merely seeing a copy of the coronation of the Virgin by a Flemish engraver, but the forced labor of Antona, an enslaved woman of African origin or descent, and her two small children who were enslaved by printer Antonio Ricardo in Lima and were active agents in the production of this image, which is found in, a, in the book that's, uh, it's thought to be the first book printed in South America. And it was aimed at evangelizing Quechua and Aymara speakers through imagery. For the remainder of my time with you, I'd like to share two images, two out of 400, <laughs> that I use in class to recenter local art makers through research methods that prioritize those most, most often rendered invisible, as Spivak says, in art and book history. There are two folios uh, that we're going to take a look at. And those art makers are a nine-year-old indigenous girl in 17th century Peru and the so-called unknown, or as I call them, once known, local art makers in both Lima workshops and in Jesuit haciendas in Nazca, Jesuit estates in Nazca. Okay. So let's start with 227. The glosses on folio 227 inform us that this is a nine-year-old girl that collects flowers and works serving elite indigenous women. Yet viewed in the way that I'm proposing, the image speaks to materiality and how this book is gendered, aged, and classed. The iron gall ink that met and is currently burning through this paper <laughs> um, is that, uh, oops, lost my place. Would have been mixed locally with the tannic acid from the terra fruit pod, uh, the terra spinosa shrub, it's native to the Andes. The plants picked by the nine-year-old girl would have been used to dye textiles, make adornments, or prepare medicine. This girl may have even collected the terra uh, fruit pods. Now, it's a thorny shrub, so this would have been a painstaking process, maybe even bloody. The watermarks on the high-quality paper identify the sheets as being made in mills in Genoa and Milan. This rag paper would have been imported to Peru as blank sheets during the latter half of the 16th century and was made with rags collect collected mostly by working women and girls, girls the same age as the girl on our folio. The painstaking labor of these women and these girls is on the surface and in the fibers of each page, yet is completely detached from scholarship on the Chronicle until we view folio 227 from a different place. The second image is that of Don Juan Capcha, who Guaman Poma describes as a grand drunk in charge of an indigenous town of four people, <laughs> a liar, idolater, conjurer, and friends of other drunkards and thieves. So not a flattering portrait. <laughs> but what I would like to focus on, however, is what's around Don Juan Capcha. A vessel containing vino añejo, uh, or brandy, and this cup, mostly, or 
most likely made of silver. First, the clay vessel. This brandy, taken by Juan Capcha from the community as tribute, but used for his own consumption, offers an example of art making by enslaved individuals within Atlantic slavery. This is incredible. It, it's so rare. I can't tell you how rare it is for us to have this example. Ceramics unearthed in two 17th century Jesuit estates in Nazca, Peru, where enslaved workers of African origin and descent produced brandy include pottery tools and vessels made from local, local clay. These were marked by the enslaved workers with designs and motifs commonly found in Central and West African art, specifically among the Yoruba and Edo peoples of Nigeria and Benin. Under enslavement, pottery became the forced labor of men, while production was historically dominated by women in Central and, and West Africa. Vases used for the storage and transport of the brandy, like the one in our drawing, as well as clay setters made solely for the personal use of the worker, display bands of wavy lines and applied decorative techniques, such as cord and fabric impressions, brushing, stylus drawings, and finger markings, often related to the cult of the rainbow serpent deity in West Africa. Similar ceramic forms unearthed in 18th century estates in Brazil demonstrate a strong correlation between certain types of scarification practices among the Joruba, known as the Nagoa, or the Mina in Brazil, the Macuas and the Angolas. It's remarkable. This is the research of uh, Brandon Weaver. He's currently at Stanford. He's, he incredibly gave me these images and, and I'm very grateful to, to him. And you can find his dissertation from Vanderbilt online that talks about these. As for the silver cup, maybe gold, um, another transcultural case of art making comes into view. To end, let me share with you a letter that I read last year at the archive while you view this image. It's from a codex produced in Mexico in the 1540s by Nahuataquiloque painter scribes, known as the Mendoza Codex. Specifically, I'd like you to uh, notice the image of the silversmith uh, trespassing knowledge onto his son. So an indigenous silver and goldsmith from Mexico who lived, worked, created, and shared with indigenous silver, silversmiths in Lima and European silversmiths in Lima for at least 16 years until this letter was penned. Perhaps it was this boy and perhaps it was this cup. It's, it's not, we can talk about that later, but <laughs> from the same workshop at least. So these are just two out of the 400 drawings. I hope that I've shared something that you hadn't seen before and I welcome all your comments and questions. Thank you.